Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, bears, Kazons, and things to episode 75 of the Muppet Trek Podcast. I'm Steve. And I'm Jarman, and we're here to compare, contrast, Ooh. and confer about our two favorite franchises. And what are those, Steve? The Muppets of Star Trek. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're going to be doing, and we have been doing, and we will be doing reviews <laughs> of the Muppet Show and Star Trek the original series. And tonight we're covering the Muppet Show with special guest star Crystal Gale and Star Trek original series episode Requiem for Methuselah. Ooh. And tell me, Steve, who is this person, Crystal Gale, on this episode of The Muppet Show? I had to look her up, too. Uh, <laughs> she is an American country singer. Country? Uh, wow. Yeah, okay. her hit song, Don't Make My Brown Eyes Blue, swept the charts in 1977. And she was part of the late 70s pop country kind of movement, where country moved a little bit more into mainstream. Mm. And she was one of the performers that really spearheaded that movement. Gotcha. Um, she had ju was just about to release or had just released her new album, which none of the songs in this episode are from <laughs> called half the way. And this was sort of, I think part of her publicity run, either running up to that or through that. Uh, uh but she's a five time Academy of country music winner and one time Grammy award winner. Hmm. What Let's the hell is she up to on the episode this week? Well, backstage scooters rehearsing a bunch of prairie dogs. Uh, and they just start kleptomaniacing everything, just taking everything they can get their hands on. They continue, continue to steal various backstage props throughout the remainder of the show. Uh, Burrowguard actually goes and visits Crystal in her dressing room and asks for her autograph, uh, but he complains when it's upside down. Uh, they steal Kermit's collar. He refuses to go on stage. Uh, Crystal gives him a feather boa. It's a mess. It's a big involved backstage plot. Uh, Can I say it, it freaked me out that I thought that that collar was part of him. I didn't know he could take that off. So, I uh, didn't. I don't know if that was in before this point. I thought it was part of his body. <laughs> like, I'm so confused. I think we all thought that. <laughs> uh, on stage this week, Kermit introduces a South German Oompa band performing Swanee with penguins, a walrus raider, dogs, and pigs. Kermit introduces Crystal Gale. She strolls in the country. She performs River Road while walking in front of a moving backdrop joined by dancing dogs, some homeless people, and other travelers. Up next, we get Pigs in Space. Dr. Strangepark says they've been invaded. It's Darth Nader. But who's behind the mask? Well, it's Gonzo, because he's got a big nose. That was revealed so well. They turn it to the side, and there it is. <laughs> uh, and then the chickens are stormtroopers. <laughs> Rolf hits the stage and performs Hold Tight, Hold Tight, joined by some free-swimming fish in the piano and a shark providing lyrics. Next up, we get another singing fish quartet who performs 60 minutes got together. A old time E2. Kermit peeks his head through and introduces the prairie dogs uh, who perform the best things in life for free, but not the one you're thinking of. Uh, and bear on patrol tries to arrest them, but then they go and they steal Statler and Waldorf's clothes. <laughs> Following this, we get Muppet Labs. They finally have a solution to the banana problem. I like that that was just the statement. Uh, once removed from the bunch, they can't be reinserted, so they sharpen them and then can use them as throwing implements, and Beaker is almost impaled multiple times. Uh, Scooter introduces Crystal Gale for her final number. She performs We Must Believe in Magic uh, on a ghost ship joined by ghostly floating Muppet figures. It was kind of creepy. Yeah, it was. Kermit thanks Crystal. The Prairie Dogs steal more things. And that is what we call the Muppet Show. So, Jeremy, what did you think of this week's episode with Crystal Gale? Um, it was, um, you know, <laughs> mediocre. Um, Chris, the problem was because I think Crystal Gale was just kind of just blah. Um, she seemed very fine. She was a very beautiful um, and very good singer. But just I think she she wasn't a very good actress. That was kind of the the where it all fell apart she wasn't really good with the muppets wasn't good in the sketches because it just all seemed very wooden and very like she was nervous um and but her she sang very well the her both of her numbers were pretty cute and the the ghost ship thing was pretty creepy um her songs were kind of repetitive and but the muppets were cool in those scenes 
And but overall, though, I liked the Muppet uh, Swine Trek uh, was pretty cool. Having a Darth Vader reference, which was kind of neat, just out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I thought wrote down in my notes that she reminds me of a woman who grew up rich so she could afford very nice singing lessons, but isn't especially unique or talented. (laughs) Is that too mean? Uh, I don't know. (laughs) No, no, no. I can totally get on board with that. The one thing I will say for this episode, because I agree, she wasn't in a ton of the episode, kind of luckily. Um. But this was a very full episode. That's true. Tons of scene backstage with the uh, with the thieves. We got dressing room scenes. Um, we had some staples uh, like Muppet Labs and the Swine Trek. Uh, we just there there was a lot in this episode. I feel like, and then we got like two unrelated fish numbers somehow. Mm. It's like they were making up for their, knowing their host was not that flashy, so they had to like pack in some right. more Muppet stuff, which was that's true. Well, and it was clear that she was there to like, you know, sing two songs or sing three songs from her album, and they and go. say and do one additional scene. Right, you know, <laughs> you could feel it. And I did like the Prairie Dogs throughout. That was that was fun. Yeah, they were fun. <laughs> um, so, music this week: Swanee, written by the George Gershwin in 1919. Um, mostly to poke fun at Stephen Foster, who wrote the song uh, "Old Folks at Home." the Florida state song, which is about old folks on the Swanee river. Right. And this whole song is just making fun of that song. That's the Florida state song. Yeah, that's right. River road from Crystal Gale's 1977 album. Where we must believe in magic. It was written, written by Sylvia Tyson. Yes. That's the Sylvia T- Sylvia Tyson of Canadian, all female supergroup quartet. <laughs> Bam. You just learned two things. Wow. Hold tight, hold tight. Made popular by the Andrews sisters. These three, uh, three actual sisters who are estimated to have sold about 80 million records over their career, but they're known best for their iconic version of Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy. In Boogie company Woogie B. Bugle Boy in Company 3. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the best things in life are free um, by De Silva Brown and Henderson from the show Good News about a college football star who falls in love with a pretty nerd who is ter- tutoring him. Mm-hmm. That age old story. And we must believe in magic from a 1977 album of the same name. The song didn't hit its peak until a few years later when it was covered by Johnny Cash. Oh. Yeah, he's the one that made it big with it. Jeremy, what did you think was the best Muppeteering moment this week? So it's kind of a cheat, but I'm going to say all the prairie dog scenes throughout the whole episode because they kind of went throughout and they're all equally uh, probably difficult to do and they were very well done where they come in and really quickly steal something and pull it off frame and then come off the frame somewhere else and like they're pulling stuff off really fast and they like the time- point they're all wearing bowler hats yeah <laughs> for some reason i love that and they and then all the times too like the person they're stealing from will be turned away just at the right moment and like that's so that was just really well done throughout the episode i like that well i also cheated and i also said the prayer <laughs> well there so. you go because it wasn't one moment it was a lot of moments but a lot of moments. i want to say we didn't get to say during our discussion what would you put this episode kind of now that we talked about all of it, even little low, low. Little you know, low. considering we're, we're two episodes into the season. It's hard to say. Yeah, it's hard to say. But John Denver was certainly better than her. <laughs> yeah, oh, for sure. He was good with the Muppets. That's the thing. So in that regard right now, she's in the bottom three <laughs> <laughs> of these first two. <laughs> right. Agreed. It's a I don't think it was a terrible episode, but it was just kind of. Since the host was so underwhelming, it brought down a lot of, like, like you said, a lot of those great Muppet skits that were throughout. It kind of brought that down a little bit. It sucked the energy out of the room, kind of. Right. But she wasn't terrible. We've had worse hosts. Um, but anyways, that brings us to our Star Trek episode, yeah. which is Requiem for Methuselah. And What is up with the names this oh, season? They're so just uh, they're esoteric. They're insane and this season. Long and just not, they don't run off the oh, tongue right, very sorry. well. Get out of this. Oh, summer. it's fine. I just can't get over it. So we have the Enterprise crew infected with Rigelian fever, which apparently can get as bad as the plague, according to Kirk later on in the episode. And the only prescription is not more cowbell, but the mineral Ritalin. <laughs> so it's not Ritalin, it's Ritalin. Uh, Kirk, Spock, and Bones then beam down to a planet where they detected the mineral that they need, but are immediately attacked by a robot. And a man called Flint calls off the robot just in time and tells them to leave his planet. But Kirk says they cannot and tells them about the sick people on the Enterprise. But Flint doesn't seem to care, and Kirk threatens to destroy him with the Enterprise phasers. But finally, Flint agrees to help when they tell him it resembles the plague. And Flint starts waxing poetic about the European Black Plague back in history, like he had been there or something. 
So he takes them back to his castle and he says the robot will collect and refine the mineral for them. And while they're waiting for the robot, they sit around his big castle and Spock notices the paintings and the music in the castle are identical to Da Vinci and Brahms, respectively, but somehow made with contemporary materials, like they were made recently, but yet they're identical to Da Vinci and Brahms. So it's confounding, it's confusing. So Flint invites them to stay for dinner, and they initially refuse until Flint introduces them to Raina, this woman that walks in. And Flint says her parents were killed in an accident, so he raised her. And immediately, all these hornballs just take an interest in Raina for no particular reason. Like they haven't seen a woman in 30 years. Um, Kirk starts. She is the only woman (laughs) in this episode. In this episode. It's like that song from the Fly of the Concords. You're the most beautiful woman in the room. Um, (laughs) But anyways, so Spock starts uh, talking to her about the great conversations they're going to have. He starts playing piano. Kirk starts dancing with her and flirting with her and he eventually kisses her. Uh, And this causes the robot to attack Kirk because he thinks he's attacking Reyna. Uh, But Spock destroys it with his phaser before it can kill Kirk. Meanwhile, back on the Enterprise... They can't find any information about Flint or Reyna on any of their computer databanks or tapes. And Bones' tricorder scan reveals that it appears Flint is over 6,000 years old, but still human somehow. So the Rydalin is finished being processed. So Reyna comes to say goodbye to Kirk. And apparently he has actually fallen in love with her in this short amount of time. And he wants her to come with him, even though she has pretty much zero personality so far. (laughs) Um, Bones tells Spock and Kirk that apparently the refined medication, even though it was supposed to be done, has disappeared. So they go to investigate and they find the room that it's in. But that room also has several Reyna bodies because apparently she's an android. And those those are the previous versions that didn't work out for Flint. But Flint comes in just then as he has been monitoring them the whole time through a view screen. And he tells them that he was actually born in 3834 B.C., He figured out in a battle that he cannot die, and then he just became Da Vinci, Brahms, and other people throughout history, including Methuselah. Uh, He grew tired of humanity. He came to this planet, and he wanted to make the perfect woman that would never age just like him, so he wanted to make an android. But apparently he had trouble learning how to love, especially him, so he was trying to manipulate Kirk so he could teach Reyna how to love, but which is a bad plan because she only fell for Kirk, not for him. Uh, Flint now tells him, yeah, but then I'll kill Kirk. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. That's how it works. Uh, Flint now tells them that they can't leave since they now know his secret, and he miniaturizes the Enterprise and puts it in his laboratory, freezing the crew in stasis, which is a pretty cool trick. Uh, but Reyna comes in just then, and he figures out that if he doesn't let Kirk and his crew go, she will hate him forever. And she's also now found out that she's an android. But then Kirk and Flint go into fisticuffs over her and start fighting. Um, and this upsets Reyna and makes her realize that she loves them both, just in different ways. And she can't; she doesn't want to disappoint or upset either of them, so her brain explodes and she falls she over. Explodes and dies. <laughs> she dies. So Kirk and the crew are then quickly returned to the Enterprise with the cure. Um, and Bones tells Kirk that apparently Flint is dying and aging as normal now. And apparently it was only Earth and its atmosphere that was keeping him immortal for some reason. Kirk is overwrought for some reason on losing Reyna and he just falls asleep in exhaustion. Um, and Bones is saying, oh, it's so sad that he's going to be so sad now because I wish he could just forget her. So Bones leaves, and then Spock goes over while he's sleeping and wipes his mind of the memories of Reyna to ease his mind because Spock is in love with Kirk, and we all know this. Um, but yeah, so that's Requiem from Methuselah. Steve, what did you think yeah. of the episode? All right, some things I liked. Uh, I liked the disease on board kickoff, but mm. it, w- it started that way because I feel like a half dozen times so far, in the show we've seen go down to planet bring something back with them people get sick and die find a way to fight thing we've seen that but for them to already be in the middle of it that's true skip some time yeah yeah skip some time and we get to actually see a different story instead of the one we'd seen we'd seen before right um i like the metal probe bot thing i just it looks like some prop guy was like all right you got seven dollars go to the or the good way. It was actually from a previous robot they've had in the show oh, before. It looked, like, it looked like two posture strainers <laughs> and like a dollar worth of pipe and five blinking lights they ripped out of something else. Oh, and grab that antenna off the TV over there. Hey, I'm using yeah, that antenna. Yeah, yeah. Not a, grab it. Just get it. <laughs> um, so I thought that was, that was, I like that. that nice. I like that it was a good mystery in that it, it was a genuine surprise when it, when he turned out to be immortal. Hmm. You know, we had all these clues, but none of them made sense to me. Like, right. None of them led me to believe, like, ah, oh, he's the immortal. He's Da Vinci, of course. 
<laughs> nothing led me to that until he said it. And I was like, oh, all right. Ooh. All right, I see where you're going with this. <laughs> uh, some things I struggled with a little bit. How many robots can Kirk possibly teach how to love? <laughs> and to die with confusion. <laughs> like clones and robots. And, you know, just I feel like he's just going across the universe teaching women to love. <laughs> That's what he does. Man. Uh, it's just too much. It was too much this episode. Uh, I think this have, could have been a great setup for a character we would see again, Methuselah. Mm. Like, I, you know, an immortal man drifting through space who comes and lends advice to Starfleet from time to time. That would have been a great character. But at the end, they effectively killed him off. Yeah. They're like, I, well, now that he's out of Earth's atmosphere, he will age like the rest of us. I was like, ah. I bet he's in some books or something. Right, but you gotta. I'm like, man, get, and then he's Highlander too. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> that's his story. He was a Highlander, but he left Earth to get away from the competition. What? Where's that story? <laughs> that's what I'm telling you, Highlander. <laughs> he could just be Highlander. Yeah, I'm just saying he's Highlander. That'd be a great subplot for Highlander. That's true. <laughs> uh, and the and for, in the second one, they're all aliens anyway, so it makes perfect sense. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, dude, they want you to forget about that, too. <laughs> There's an entire cut of the film that just cuts out everything about them being from another planet. <laughs> oh, I like that better. <laughs> uh, um, I like the idea of the episode because I was like the uh, sci-fi stories about immortals always fascinate me. I love that idea. Yep. Just, I want to be immortal. So, you know, that whole thing. Um, I do love that. It, that last scene was totally like Spock just showing how much he loves Kirk. And I love that because it like Bones Bones is talking. He's just staring at Kirk and like, oh, no. My friend is in trouble and is troubled. Um, I do think that would have been better if uh, she, the woman, Reyna, was falling for Spock because she was so bred and raised to be so um, into learning and ac academia. And she was so interested in meeting a, a Vulcan. And then all of a sudden she just falls for Kirk, like he, who's like this, who would seem like a total dumbass compared to her. You know, like it just seems like. No, 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 Jarman. But then this, this episode wouldn't have been about William Shatner. Like that's that. true. We couldn't have that. I mean, yeah, that's the problem with that. But also, I think uh, making Flint wanting a ma female companion as his number one goal and he was so quick to anger and jealousy kind of like lessened his cool factor for me because he's over thousands of years old and he's still an immature, like selfish brat. Like, that's just kind of unimpressive to me. I'm like, oh, man, they could have made him cooler and more profound and interesting. But he's just a another guy, you know. Um, but I like the, the plot in general. So. I don't know. I, I thought not a terrible episode, but better than last week's, but not fantastic either. But I don't know. Did yeah, you like it a little bit more? Assessment. Yeah, fair assessment. Okay, you liked it about the same amount. Okay, so that's good. It was, but it was better than last week. That was not that was good. So some triggers for this episode. Uh, one of the many Star Trek productions resembling William Shakespeare's The Tempest or right. Forbidden Planet. But I remember Tempest more, like having the older man with his young daughter on this, you know, world by themselves. Um. The Brahms uh, paraphrase that Spock plays was written especially for this episode. So that it's like a whole cool. original piece. It was not actually Brahms. Uh, the last name Reina Kapek that he gave her as a fake name is an anagram of the last name of Carol Kapek, spelled the C and the K at the end, the Czech author who popularized the term robot. Um, so that's a pretty cool little Easter egg there. Uh, the episode was written by Jerome Bixby who would later write the play and then the movie, The Man from Earth, which if anyone's seen that, I love it, which also follows the same kind of story, all about an immortal man who has taken on several famous identities throughout history. And the actor who plays Dr. Phlox on Star Trek Enterprise has a major role in the film version. So there's a big connection there. Um, but yeah, that's a great movie if you could watch it. It was made probably like maybe 20 years ago, 2000s sometime. Um, but it's just about this guy who he lets his close friends know that he was actually several historical figures throughout history and he can't die. So he has to, he has to move on. And this guy who wrote this episode wrote that. So basically it's like, the, this is like the prototype for that movie and, uh, play coming out later. Um, it seems odd that the death of a woman or this woman in the episode, uh, affected Kirk so much because he fell in love with Edith Keeler and Miramani in that old episode. And, kind of just moved on but for some reason woman who he barely talked to it's like distressing him or maybe it's like the third strike it's like he's now just so distressed because it's happened so many times i don't know but that was i was actually in the trivia but i'm like that's no, just more of like a good point <laughs> about this episode um 
Uh, Spock uses the mind meld at the end of this episode to tell Kirk, forget. He uses the same technique on McCoy in The Wrath of Khan and says, remember, later on. So that's kind of a little connection. Oh. And the last thing uh, that gun. Yeah, is uh, the episode is referenced in Star Trek Voyager, the episode concerning flight, when Captain Catherine Janeway mentions that Captain Kirk claimed to have met Leonardo da Vinci. So we'll see that much later down the line when she says that line. We've we've seen that episode now. <laughs> so, Stephen, what are our Trek connection mother connections this week? Uh, Crystal Gale, for our Canadian listeners, was in the 1983 SCTV episode called Star is Born. SCTV also did several Star Trek sketches. Great show. Uh, one of those Star Trek sketches uh, stars Harold Ramis as Spock. It's something to see. Nice. It's on YouTube. Check it out. Uh, Crystal Gale was the voice in 1993 character of Emily on The Country Mouse and the City Mouse, A Christmas Tale. Opposite her was John Lithgow. Lithgow played Dick in Third Rock from the Sun, on which William Shatner did a cameo. Very nice. This week was very difficult. <laughs> that was a pretty good connection. <laughs> but, I mean, these were basically the same episode. Yeah, thank God or I just that. watched one of them twice. Yeah, why would we do that? But Because just like uh, it turns out that Rainer is an android all along, and it turns out Crystal Gale acts as well as an android as well. <laughs> ah. Both feature an infestation, the backstage by thieving prairie dogs, and the enterprise by the Rigelian flu. Oh, very Rigelian nice. flu? Right, Rig- Rigelian? Rigelian? Rigelian flu. Rigelian flu. Rigelian flu. <laughs> so sure. Rainer the android was confused as to whether to stay home with Flint or to run away with Kirk, just as Crystal Gale in the River Road song was conflicted on whether to run away or return home. <laughs> Both feature science. Science. Uh, bones processing the medicine in a lab and Dr. Bunsen Honeydew finally solving the banana problem. They finally solved it. <laughs> they finally solved it. <laughs> oh, God. What's that noise? Transporter malfunction. Transporter malfunction. It's always surprising. It takes me by surprise. So here's part of the show where we transport one character from one episode to the other and vice versa. So what you got for us, Steve? Correct my business week, I'm going to bring over four of those space probes and replace the singing fish quartet. <laughs> With the space probes. <laughs> just singing anything. It could be anything. I just want to see four of those things make beeping and whirring noises. Very nice. Star Trek to Muppets, I'm going to transport Flint slash Methuselah over in place of Statler or Waldorf. And when his clothes are taken away by the prairie dogs, he finds a way to miniaturize and freeze them all in time. So they're they're taken care of. The infestation is frozen, <laughs> miniaturized. <laughs> uh, I've got the prairie dogs coming over to then replace the metal probe. And they're all just doing Methuselah's bidding. <laughs> I They'll like go it. and process the drugs. Don't worry. it come to dinner. And they're wearing little bowler hats. <laughs> yeah, they're all wearing bowler hats. And they serve dinner. I like it. Uh, Muppets of Star Trek. Honestly, you could switch over Crystal Gale with the android and no one would notice. So that's what I'm going to do. True. It was pretty flat. And that brings us to the end of episode 75 of the Muppet Trek podcast. Join us next time for the Muppet Show with special guests, Shields and Yarnell. Whoever the hell they are. And original series episode, The Way to Eden. So from the lovers, the dreamers and us. Live long and prosper, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Muppet Trek Podcast. Be sure to follow us on social media on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. This podcast has been brought to you by A Play on Nerds. Oh, 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 o